Hi, this is Brian Welch. I'm the publisher of Mother Earth News Magazine. And I'm here at the Mother Earth News Fair. We're in the Runaway Pony Bed and Breakfast right across the street from the fair in Lawrence, Kansas. And I'm sitting with Pat Foreman, a friend, kind of a hero, and one of the world's foremost authorities, really, on the relationship between humans and nature as it's demonstrated by the care and feeding and, and neighborly cohabitation with poultry. Pat, welcome to Lawrence. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Brian, for have us, having me. And Oprah Henfrey. Of course, I She's failed to introduce Oprah, Oprah Henfrey. Yes, you, you see, the reality is I'm, I'm really just a, an arm rest and a clucking mouthpiece for these chickens. It's their story, well. and I'm just uh, the deliverer of it. So it's Oprah Henfrey, and it's uh, capital H-E-N hyphen F-R-E-E, -E, Henfrey. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and the truth is we like to have Oprah Henfrey's <coughs> in every backyard in America who wants them. So she's not the only one. We want to have them uh, all across North America and even the world. What kind of chicken is Oprah? This particular Oprah is a Welsimer. It's a, it's a heritage breed. Uh, belongs to Cheryl Long, your editor in chief. Yeah, we, we met about 24 hours ago, and uh, she lays dark brown chocolate eggs. Yes. Colored eggs. They're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, they are. So absolutely she's just beautiful. a young bird. She's probably, I'd guess, about a year old. And so the egg is specific to the breed? Yes, it is. Yeah, and you can often tell the color of an egg by their color of their earlobe. Believe it or not. And she does have a dark brown earlobe. And ear she does lobe, have an she? Yeah. And you'll find that a lot of the legerns that lay the white eggs have white earlobes. So that's, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty accurate. You Hi. can pet her. How are you? Yeah. She's, okay. she's uh, been petted by, oh gosh, hundreds of people yesterday. Some famous there. people, probably. Um, yeah. Well, uh, some famous people. You've been probably. petted by famous people, huh, Oprah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our, our uh, star. Our female lead in uh, this episode has gone back to her trailer. Uh, she needed to take a break. There are some uh, dogs in the room and whatnot. It made her a little nervous. But she did leave behind <laughs> a couple of beautiful, well summer eggs. Uh, so you talk about dark brown. These are not like the brown eggs that you might find at the supermarket. They're really special and quite beautiful in and of themselves, aren't they? They, they, they are. are. They are. And these are, these are a little pullet eggs. These from, are, they're small, so they're from a younger chicken. Uh, they'll get full-sized in about uh, two to three months. But you get some of these eggs with some of the Americana eggs that are turquoise and some right. white eggs. Right. And you have all of a sudden an eye candy dozen eggs. And you can sell them, especially around Easter time, for big bucks, like $12 a dozen. Oh, yeah. Get them no out. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's seriously. really cool. So uh, I have an eye candy flock at home that lays all kinds of variety of eggs. You know, I do I too. I keep it. the same kind of flock for the same reason. It's just so fun to see uh. what's... See what you get in the morning. I, I never get tired of collecting the eggs. Right. I don't know what it is, but it's just a, it's like a daily joy. And it's like eggs and hope spring eternal. So yes. that's one of my mottos. So if, if I'm having a down day or something, I'll just go collect the eggs. And they'd say, <laughs> there's always more. There's always more. It's is it well summer like Oprah an appropriate uh, chicken for a backyard flock? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Are there breeds um, that aren't appropriate chickens for ba backyard flocks? Are there breeds that are not appropriate for backyard flocks? That's, well, it's like saying, are there dogs that are not appropriate for backyard dogs? Yes. And it's such a personal preference. Um, and when people ask me, what kind of breed do, you, do I suggest or recommend? I suggest get one of these poultry catalogs and go through them and see what appeals to you. Some really like the top crown, some, uh, sure. and so when you get the fancy breeds in there, that's one thing, and then when you, sort of want to just do eggs or if you want to just do meat or what, then you start to get into specific breeds that are bred for that purpose. Are there some breeds that are, I guess, more self-reliant than others? Yes, there are some breeds that are more self-reliant than others and those tend to be the heritage breeds. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm all for the heritage breeds in, in a huge way for so many reasons we can go into if you want to go a little deeper, but um, they're, they're, they're better foragers, they tend to be hardier than the commercial breeds, uh, and the commercial breeds being the ones for the egg layers and the and the meat birds, the that they're bred for that's that specific. Plus, they they, they tend to um, be I like the dual purpose breeds because they'll lay eggs as well as sure. at the end of it. They're also there for for meat if yes. you want to process them. Of course, you can eat and any can. chicken, but some you chickens can. have a carcass or do to create a carcass that's just a better meal. It, some chickens create carcasses that are a much better meal, not just a little bit better. And we're finding out more and more that this rapid growth or a lot of egg laying 
uh, it takes its toll on the nutrition of that, that nutritional product. Yes. And it's different than what you would get from a slower growing animal or chicken or from a less abundant uh, producing hen. That leads us back so. to heritage breeds. When you say heritage breed, what you're talking about is a breed that was developed sort of before industrial agriculture. And so those breeds were typically developed around the world to live with a family to produce both meat and eggs. Right. To survive to some extent or another on their own with, you know, rather than inside of a barn. They're, they're foragers. They're a more natural bird, typically. Is that right? Exactly. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head, Brian. They're, they're the ones, humans have been like with, with, like with dogs and cats, chickens have followed humans through our through our life paths for about 10,000 recorded years. 10,000 years. At least. That we know. know. That we know of. And who uh -huh. knows how far it goes back before that. So it's been part of our culture and it makes sense. I mean, the, the, the dogs, cats, and chickens had come around human settlements for protection as well as food. And, and then the, uh, the, the chickens and would, give, anyway, give the, the humans food, um, eggs and meat. So even the Roman armies would travel with chickens as, as part of their venue. Um, even Robert E. Lee, that great general, is said to have traveled with a chicken during the Civil War. She slept under his cot at night and she'd give the general an egg for his breakfast. <laughs> and her name was Nellie. You know, so how, how close can you be to that? There's a saying that goes, once you get chickens, then you fall in love. Because there's something so disarming and so, so tender and, uh, around, around a lot of chickens. I mean, yeah. not all chickens, I'm not saying that, but they're, it's documented that, that Humans tend to be, when they're around just a flock, the heart rate will go down, the breath gets deeper, and there are places that are with, working with juvenile kids, for example, that as soon as those kids get around to some chickens, they calm down. The, the kids huh. calm down. Huh. And there's another, another place called the, uh, the college school. It's for, for just the wee ones that want to go to college. But if there's an argument, they'll give them a chicken to carry around the track, and by the time they come back around the track with that chicken, their state has shifted, and they're able to then talk more about huh. reasonable and about their experience. So they're, they're remarkable. That's we, a lovely image. Yeah, well therapy <laughs> chickens is an up and growing profession for a lot of these poultry. Um, and I've taken chickens into nursing homes and retirement centers, uh, even a hospice chicken, believe it or not, yeah. and had just amazing responses. To, uh, yeah. So there are mental health benefits to keeping chickens around. There are, that's one of their hidden talents, one of their many skill sets. And let's talk about the physical health benefits to having a backyard flock a little bit. You were talking earlier about the fact that chickens that grow in a na under natural circumstances and grow more slowly, varieties that grow more slowly, mm -hmm. are probably investing more nutritional value in both their meat and their eggs. Yes, that's right, that's um, right. which is huge. In our, in our culture, I think, I'm, I'm a pharmacist uh, by trade and I have a degree in animal science, genetics and nutrition. So, so I think a lot of the problems, a lot of the crises that our culture is facing is largely due to demineralized soils and, and non-nutritious foods yes. that, is, that is sort of then replicating on to all, all aspects of our, our life. How much more nutritional are eggs from free-range chickens that are raised, uh, say, in the backyard or in the farmyard than industrial eggs? Do we know? Well, Mother Earth News published a wonderful article about I that. I pitched that one yes, right to you. Yes, yes. And it, I tell you, I refer to that article so often, and I've got about 10 or 15 articles in my files that replicate the results that you guys got. And Which is very high levels of vitamin D. High levels of D, A, uh, the right cholesterol in there. I mean, it, it's, it's a different food product. This egg is a different food product from what you would buy from a factory farm hen. Much higher and percentages of omega-3 fatty acids, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, it's across the board yes. in so much of it. And it just makes sense. By the time a commercial hen lays an egg a day for two years, there's nothing left of her. I mean, she only weighs about two and a half to three pounds anyway. Yes. And to produce an egg the size of her head every yeah. day on some of the, on the, you know, the, it's just, they're metabolic miracles, but, but how much has she given up to herself? And so, of course. So an, a hen that's out on green pasture in the sunlight eating bugs, getting exercise, um, it makes a big difference. So if I'm intrigued, if, I'm, if I live in a suburban area and I'm intrigued and I really kind of think I'd like to have chickens around, um, what, how do I need to be equipped? What's the, what are the first things I need to make sure that I can provide? Well, fresh water and uh, nutritious, not the most expensive, but nutritious feed, and a safe place to roam around. 
that's that's the main thing. And th so the safe place to roam around that probably includes some kind of chicken coop. Yeah, at night chickens are uh, night blind. They're totally night blind. That's why they're so vulnerable at night. Oh. They can't see a thing. So any of those night predators have a total advantage over them. They can flop and flap around, but but they're 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 just sitting ducks. There's actually there. a good tip in there too. People sometimes ask me, well, you know, if you need to catch a chicken or you need to move yes. a chicken, how do you do it? And I, I explained that well at night you can basically pick up any chicken and tow right. them around. They're they're defenseless. They're they are defenseless. Even the roosters are right. defenseless. Yes. So you, so you want to have a coop, and they like to be up off the ground. They feel much safer if they're up off the ground. And you need to have a coop that is absolutely predator safe. And by that I mean even even a hole that might be two to three inches big in the coop is too big because weasels can even get in there. Of course. And I lost my entire flock one night to a weasel, and I knew that little hole was there, but I didn't think, oh, what I thought is a raccoon or possum can't get in there. I don't need to worry about it, and I was so wrong. And it killed your so whole flock in one all night. All but one hen who was just cowering in the corner, Heaven and sake. she had post-traumatic predator syndrome and would not go back in that coop. Oh, really? So I, had, I moved the coop. That's when I moved the coop up to my house, yeah. and it's about 30... Um, uh, uh, it's about 20 yards from my office window. Yeah. And and uh, when, once I moved that coop up by my house, I started watching from my office, and I've spent countless hours. I mean, I watch chickens a lot. I probably clock more chicken hours than anybody. <laughs> but that's when I started really understanding their personalities and how they interact with each other. And that's when I started writing City Chicks, is because the chickens that I worked with before um, mainly were there to build topsoil by using their fertilizer to, to yeah. increase soil fertility and uh, the tilth uh, and, the, and the organic matter in it or, and or for meat and, and eggs. So I loved them, but it wasn't the same as when they really became a family flock. Then I start to really study them and, and understand them more. What about the noise? Are you going to drive your neighbors crazy if you have chickens in your backyard? No, in fact, most of my neighbors now have roosters as well in their backyards. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't mind. No, they, they, well, I haven't heard any complaints, and they love the eggs. So in but some uh, places, though, I would suspect that neighbors would not be so tolerant of the chickens. Can you keep just hens? Uh, yes, you can keep just hens, and hens, when they're at their loudest, have, the, when they cluck, when they're laying an egg about their loudest, it's about the same decibel level as you and I talking here yes, right now. Yes, not very, not very it's loud It's not loud, it's not offensive. There, there was a case up on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., where, where a neighbor had chickens for, for two years and their neighbors never knew it. And they lay, they lay eggs whether there are roosters around or not. That's correct, they lay eggs whether the roosters are around or not. Can they share a yard with a dog? They can share a yard with a dog. I have two dogs. They're uh, ter mixed terrier crosses. One's a Jack rough coat Jack Russell, and they're certified poultry protectors. Their job, they know, is to help help save these, uh, help protect the chickens, as do the roosters. So the, you yeah. get good company, Excellent. mental health benefits, yeah? physical health benefits. Yeah. It, it starts to sound like owning some poultry is almost an irreplaceable aspect of a healthy lifestyle. I wish I had said that. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, well, everybody should have some chickens. Everyone should have some. Well, here, here's what's so interesting is you're, you've heard of watersheds. Right? Sure. Well, egg sheds. Have you heard of an egg shed? No. Well, an egg shed, of course, is how far does your egg have to travel to your plate? Right. And, and when you start, it's not that hard to calculate. I, I, I blogged on, on a Mother Earth blog site. There's an egg, sh the egg shed. Egg shed series is on there. And what's amazing when you run the numbers, if, if just 10% of a population had 10 hens each, 10% of a population had 10 hens each, that would meet, according to the egg board standards, the egg shed demands. Really? Really. Wow. Wow. So, so it's then possible. everybody's eggs would be local eggs. It's possible for a community to be protein food self sufficient relatively easily yeah. with chickens. Uh, and that's wow. protein that doesn't have to travel 1,200 miles through a feedlot to get to your plate. It doesn't have to go through, you know, a year and a half on pasture. Are there any so. climates where I cannot have chickens? Are there any climates where you can now have chickens? There's, um, there's over 7,000 breeds of chickens in the world. We don't really even know how many they are. Right. And they're all specific towards different microclimates and niches. Sure. So depending on, um, depending on that microclimate, 
So I breed and hatch my own chickens every year. Excellent. And so mine are sort of a land race, meaning that yeah. they're, they're sort of adapted to the way we keep chickens, and uh -huh. uh, which is actually to provide very little care at all. Yes. And they're uh -huh. purely free range. You've been yeah. to my house and seen yeah, them it's beautiful. wandering about. Yes. Um, but one of the breeds, uh, some of the breeds that created the genetic foundation for my flock were included uh, Sumatras, yes, you excellent. know, from Southeast Asia, yep. and Icelandics uh -huh. from Iceland. Yes. And uh, both of those They're wonderful breeds. Both of them chickens really have nice. adapted very well to Kansas, mm -hmm. and they are both, you know, very independent and hardy and, and able to take care of themselves to a very great degree. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, sort of calling on that ancient genetic heritage from all around the world to you know, come together and sort of create a, a chicken that this is well adapted to not only the climate of where I live, but also our lifestyle and the way we keep chickens. Absolutely, yeah, hmm. yeah. And they learn to take care of themselves. I mean, so yes. that's the thing with a lot of the commercial breeds is, and I'm not against commercial agriculture. Let me be very clear about that. I'm not gonna, but what I am for is local foods. And, and the more local foods we have that, that are grown in the healthy living soils, which chickens can help create. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the key in, 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 in so many ways. The, if I can just retrograde just a touch. My, my first experience with chickens was not for eggs or for great companionship or, or, uh, or meat. None of that. It was specifically to build topsoil for a community farm that was forming up in, in Vermont in the Intervale hmm. Foundation. I was working uh, I was with Andy Lee at the time and working with the um, uh, Gardener Supply and they had this big floodplain that was sandy, sandy, sandy loam. So the first thing that you sought was chicken manure. Well, the first, we were reading about permaculture. I'm a permaculture. You got interested in the manure first and the chickens later. I got interested in how do we build topsoil and f fast. Right. And so we built a chicken tractor and we put it on the front of the garden row and we moved it every day. What's a chicken tractor? A chicken tractor is a bottomless portable cage and we would, had read about them in, in uh, uh, permaculture. Mother Earth News. Uh, Thomas, <laughs> Mother Earth News, absolutely. Thomas Jefferson had a cow tractor and there are pig tractors, so we didn't make anything new, new about it. Yes. But but we, just, we, we built one of these bottom, way over it. it was Three people had to move it, it was so heavy. And then we put the chickens in there and moved it and went down the end of the row, hopped the path, came back this way, hopped the path. And by the time we got back here, then the cover crop had grown and so the chickens would forage on that. And the time we did that a few times, guess what happened to the soil? It's much better. It exploded. I mean, the soil tilt was up there, the fertility was up there. It was so phenomenal. We had created topsoil in a really short time. Hyperproductive little chinks of land. So then the next year we asked the University of Vermont to duplicate our results, and they did. Yeah. So then we knew we had something really big about creating topsoil, and that's when we wrote Chicken Tractor, uh, co-authored Chicken Tractor. Yes, right. 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah. What a great story. So, uh, they improve your mental and emotional health because they're just okay. good to be around. Uh -huh. The consumption of naturally raised chickens has been proven to be healthier mm -hmm. for your body. Mm -hmm. So mind and body are covered. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying that not only do the chickens feed off of the land, but they, give, but they feed the land in return because they produce a, very, uh, a manure that's very nutritious for your lawn or your garden or wherever it lands. Mm -hmm. And over time, I guess, that probably produces foliage, which when the chickens graze it, in turn makes them even healthier. Let's up the ante, Brian. Please. Let's up, a, let's up it billions of times. See, here, here's where chickens really are going to be superstars, or are superstars in my opinion, is, is all that biomass that goes into the trash system right now. Right. About half of every, all the trash that's collected in America, approximately, about half of it could be composted in some form or another. Right. And of that half, about one third of it comes from residential areas. Right. So that one third of that one half, what can happen is you can take all that leaf and yard waste, you can take your food scraps, you can keep it in your backyard, you add manure, high in nitrogen from your chickens to all that browns, to the, the biomass, and bingo, you've got compost and topsoil. Huh. While at the same time you're diverting tons and tons of, of, of biomass from going into the landfills where it just creates methane gas anyway, a sure, global warming right, gas, of and you're creating topsoil to grow local foods in. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally, and right now, uh, the book Collapse by Jared Diamond, have you read that? Sure. How, how societies choose to succeed or fail, how yes. we choose, I mean, yes. that's the key. Right. Well, right now, we're choosing to fail. 
two of the top things in, in the, the, the eight factors that he came across were topsoil and water. And we, we're losing topsoil globally at the rate of about the size of Indiana every year. And yet our population continues to grow. There are more sure. stresses on our topsoil to produce, and yet sure. we have less and less of it. So that's how these hyperproductive chinks of land that, that Robert Rubidale talked about that just before he, he died, these hyperproductive chinks of land can be created through what we're trashing with the skill sets of employing chickens in our backyards. Well, I think you're telling me that chickens can help save humanity. That's right. That's a very hopeful message. I it's a little bizarre message, but when it kind of... No, not I think... Well, not only that, one more factor to it. Okay. They can help us kick the oil habit. Chickens can help us kick the oil habit. That's right. What do chickens have to do with oil? Well, where does, where does almost all commercial fertilizer come from? Oil? Yes. And how about a lot of the uh, insecticides? Oil. And some of the herbicides? Oil. You look in your backyard with a family flock, you've got a clucking oil well back there. Yeah, <laughs> because they produce a, a fertilizer, because they eat the pests, they're the ticks, the flies, uh -huh. they write, of course they are. And you can and clear land with chickens. And I mean, you can clear land with chickens. Well, I really appreciate that message, and I appreciate your joining us here, Pat. This has been a lot of fun, oh, great I'm conversation. I'm so honored and to be here. Thanks for bringing Oprah Henfrey along as well. Would oh, she's, she's thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Uh, and uh, would you like to join us for the sign-off, do you think? Sure. Well, again, this is Brian Welch with Mother Earth News Magazine. And, we, and I uh, just want to say thanks to Pat Foreman and Oprah Henfrey. Pat's the author of the Chickens and You training series. And Oprah is her partner uh, in this series and in this project. And they've joined us here at the Runaway Pony Bed and Breakfast in Lawrence, Kansas, next door to the Mother Earth News Fair. Thanks a lot for joining us. I hope you will again. Mm -hmm.